There's no doubt that the American family is in trouble today. And we have seen, as a matter of fact, just over the last few decades, a steep decline in the moral fabric of our society, of our nation. But I do believe that one of the reasons, and I'm sure there are several factors which are involved, but no doubt one of the reasons has to do with those who are to be the leaders of the family, to a great degree, failed in their responsibilities and in their duties. Fatherhood is a great privilege. We find in the Bible that children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Psalm 127 and verse 3. And so the responsibilities that we have as fathers is God-given. He has placed upon us various duties that He expects us to fulfill. And if we fail in those responsibilities, then the home suffers. And then, of course, there are other far-reaching effects because inevitably, the communities, the cities, the towns in which we live will also suffer. And ultimately, even the nation will suffer. And so then, it's incumbent upon us to go to the Bible because God is the author of the family. He is the one who created man and woman and joined them, to, joined them together as husband and wife. He is the author of the home. And so then we need to go to His Word to see what He has to say to fathers about being the kind of fathers that He expects us to be. In Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 16, we find some words that were a part of the law that, gave, that God gave to His people, the Israelite nation. God said through Moses, Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. There's no doubt whatsoever that God has always placed a great premium on the family. The family has always been important to Him. And so then it should not surprise us to read in the commandments that He gave to the Israelite nation after their release from Egyptian bondage that one of those commands involved the family. As a matter of fact, more than one of them involve the family. But there's one of the commands that involves the responsibilities of young people in the home. Honor thy father and thy mother. This was so important to God that He also required that those who were disobedient to this command that those who would curse father or mother were to be put to death. It was a capital offense. That tells us about how important that was to God. But then again, we need to understand that it continues to be important to Him today. Because this command was also made a part of the law of Christ. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, we find that even in the New Testament, the command is, honor thy father and thy mother. So the home still continues to be premium with God. It's very, very important to Him. We can look to the Bible and we can study the subject, the kind of fathers that we do not need today. And I can assure you that we would have many examples to look to that God has provided for us in His Word. But for the next few moments, I want us to look at 
the kind of fathers which are needed today. Because God has also provided examples of those. And as we look at these fathers and we look at what they did and what was important to them and the conviction and the commitment that they had, then you and I should realize as fathers we need to strive to be like them. Think about Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Well, along the same lines, we need to be the kind of fathers that we're going to look at for the next few moments. Let's look at a few of them. The kinds of fathers needed. First of all, there's Enoch. We read of Enoch in the Bible. His first mention is Genesis chapter 5. Verses 21 through 24. And then we read about him in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5 and Jude verses 14 and 15. Now when you think about Enoch, one of the first things that you think about are the words that the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 11 and 5. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Now you know that an individual who was so righteous, who was so dedicated, who was so convicted that he was striving to follow the Lord in everything that he did. That's something to consider. And it's certainly something that causes us to take notice. When we read in the Bible that this man was so great in the sight of God that God allowed him to bypass death. So God took him. Well, one of the things that we learn about Enoch from Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 and following, is that Enoch walked with God. Now I want to tell you something. We learn of some other men in the Old Testament who also walked with God. But this is what it says about Enoch. He walked with God. Now I want to tell you something, my friends. Just in that short statement, you learn a great deal about Enoch. If we read that he walked with God, that tells us that his allegiance was to God. That he had a great love for Jehovah. And that the commandments of God was so very, very important to him that he was striving to the very best of his ability to live according to the commandments that God gave. Now, of course, we know that prior to the Mosaic Age, God ruled men through His patriarchal law. The law that He gave to the heads of families. And Enoch was one who was striving to live in harmony with the law that God gave. He loved God. He sought to follow God in everything that He did. And so then, as you look at Enoch, the lesson that we learn about him is that he provided the example for his children that they needed. Now you read about his children in Genesis chapter 5, verses 23 and 24 and 25. And some of his children are mentioned there. But among other things, we know that he served as, a, as an example for them to follow. And it is also worth noting that his children observed the example that he was setting. I want to tell you something. If you teach your children and yet you fail to provide the example for them, then we've done them one of the greatest disservices that we could do to our children. And long after they have forgotten what our words were, they're going to remember what the example was that they saw. The example that they observed. And so then, when we look at Enoch, we learn that he provided the example for his children to follow. But then you think about Noah. And of course, if you were to list 
a number of the great fathers that we read about in the Old Testament, no doubt Noah would stand at the very top of the list. And every young person knows about Noah. Every child. We read about him in Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, and 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. We know from looking at Genesis chapter 6 that the thoughts of man's heart was evil continually. And God determined that He was going to bring a great flood of water upon the earth. But there was one man whom the Lord called righteous. The Bible refers to him as a perfect man. That is, one who is spiritually complete. One who is upright as far as morality was concerned. And as far as righteousness was concerned. So God determined then that He would spare Noah and his family from the great flood. And He provided a plan for their salvation from the flood. That plan was that He was to build an ark. God gave him the exact specifications of the ark. He told him how many windows, doors to put in it. He told him how to go about constructing it, that it was to be with pitch without and pitch within, on the inside of it. And he gave him all of the instructions that he needed. And then we read in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 22, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And again, just from that one verse, you learn a great deal about Noah. I want to tell you something. Sometimes the critics of the Bible will argue that Noah preached for 120 years and he didn't save anybody. Well, let me tell you, he saved his family. He saved his children. And I want to tell you some of the ones who heard his preaching during those years those were his children. His sons worked with him, right alongside him, throughout all of those years that he was constructing the ark. And throughout that time, as Noah, as Peter refers to him as a preacher of righteousness, his sons were listening to him. His sons were listening to his words. And I have every reason to believe that among those to whom Noah was preaching was his own children. He wanted them to know. And remember now, this was during the age of the patriarchs. Noah was one of the patriarchs, so it was his responsibility to convey to his family, to convey to his children what God wanted them to know. And so he taught them. And so he saved his children which is a lot more than many today could say. Oh, how unfortunate it is that there are so many fathers today who are so busy making a living and so busy with the other things of life that, that draws their interest that they neglect their own children and they fail to teach their own children and they fail in the most serious and solemn responsibility that they could have. That is, of nurturing the souls of their children. Because, let me tell you, we need to realize that the soul that these children have been given to us by God for just a short period of time. And you and I have about 18 years or so to nurture their souls, to teach them and to train them and throughout those 18 years, let me tell you what we're doing. We are preparing those children for eternity. And we want to succeed. And so then as we look at Noah, we see that he taught his children, which of course resulted in their being saved also from the flood. And then there's Abraham. Abraham also would be at the top of the list. If we were to list great fathers of the Old Testament, we read about Abraham in Genesis 18 and verse 19. And I want to tell you something about Abraham. When you read that verse of Scripture, this is what God said. For I know him 
that He will command His family and His children after Him and that they will keep the way of the Lord. What greater compliment could be paid to any man than that which was paid to Abraham by God? I want you to think for just a moment about what God said about Abraham. God said, I know it. I know this man. I know what he will do. This is what he will do. He will command his family, his household after him. He will command his children. And they will keep the way of the Lord. We read in the Old Testament in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's one of the things that Abraham was doing with his children. He was training them. And the idea of train is not just to teach, but to show them what they need to do. Train them. And in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, Paul says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up. You could substitute the word train, and it would mean the very same thing. Bring them up in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. Bring them up. That's what Abraham did. He brought his children up. He trained them. He nurtured their souls. He taught them what they needed to know. And he also provided the example that they needed to follow. And it's no wonder then that Paul in Romans chapter 4 and verse 11 refers to him as the father of all them that believe. The father of all them who have faith. Because the kind of faith that you and I are to have in God is to be patterned after the faith that Abraham had. And you know, you think about the fact that his children also had the opportunity to observe his faith. One of his children, even firsthand, as Abraham put him on an altar, and was about to offer him as a sacrifice to God. And what that young man came to realize was that my father is going to obey God. My father is going to obey God. You know the story. How that Abraham raised the dagger and was about to thrust it into the flesh of his son Isaac. And the angel of the Lord stayed his hand. A test of Abraham's faith. And so then, when you think about Abraham, you think about him being the model that his children needed. And our young people need role models today. And what better role model could his children have had than to have a father who had such faith in God that he was willing to sacrifice his own child in following the instructions of God? There's Joshua. We read about Joshua in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. He presented a challenge to the people of Israel. And keep in mind as this challenge is presented, remember how wavering their faith was, the Israelite people. And sometimes they had no faith at all. And so he told them in verse 14, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods that your father served that were on the other side of the flood. By the way, the word flood there is not a reference to the great flood of, of water that came upon the earth during Noah's time. Sometimes the Jordan River was referred to as the flood. And so he was telling them on the other side of Jordan. A reference to the time that they were in Egypt. Choose who you're going to serve. But then he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That was conviction. That was dedication. He was determined to serve Jehovah. And so he was telling the people of Israel, you need to make your choice. You need to make up your minds whose side you're going to be on. You need to decide who you're going to follow. But he said, this is what we're going to do. This is what my family is going to do. We're going to serve the Lord. 
And note also in these words, there's a reference not just to himself, but to his family. This is what we're going to do. And so then Joshua is an example of courage. Standing before the people of Israel who had a wavering faith. And he had the courage to tell them what he and his family were going to do. And then finally, there's Zacharias. We read of Zacharias and his wife in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And we read that they were both righteous before the Lord. Now there's something significant, significant about that because remember, this is before the birth of their son. This is before the birth of John the Baptist. And we read that they were both righteous. What does that tell us about him? That tells us that he acquired the qualities that he needed before he ever became a father. He was prepared for fatherhood. He made the necessary preparation. You don't wait until your children are born before you decide you're going to be what you need to be as a father. You don't wait until your children are entering into their teenage years to decide what you're going to do by way of teaching them and training them. You make that decision before they're ever born. And then, you're prepared. You and I, as fathers, would do well to imitate each one of these that we've studied about for the past few moments. If you're not a Christian, we encourage you to obey the Gospel. Jesus said in Mark 16 and 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. We would encourage you to obey the Gospel of Christ. If you're an unfaithful child of God, maybe you failed in this area of fatherhood that we talked about, then there's no better time to make some changes than right now. Renew your commitment to Christ. Renew your commitment to New Testament Christianity. We're striving to live the kind of life that the Lord would have you to live. If you're subject to His invitation, come to Jesus as together we stand and say, All things are ready. Come to the feet.